Good evening. It's good to have everybody here this evening, even though it's a sparsely populated crowd. We're glad you're here, and we're glad there's a row full of young people back there in the distance. We're glad to see you here this evening. Benny called the other day and asked if, if I could uh, fill in for Danny as he's been under the weather. He wanted to be here this morning to get his Bible class kicked off for this quarter, so he was able to do that, but uh, he's out of circulation this evening. I'm cheating tonight because I'm going to give you, at least in part, a lesson that's supposed to be delivered in Honduras. They wanted a whole seminar on gender diversity issues, and when Danny and Josh and I talked, we thought, a whole seminar? But I, uh, we have changed some of the topics, and tonight's topic is how to have a godly fa family in a, I would call it a LGBTQ plus world. This world has declined to where it's kind of a, a mess. It's not Mayberry anymore, in case you hadn't noticed. Even in the Neosho high school here in Newton County in the middle of the United States, I've been told that we are to the point now that we have litter boxes out for those who identify as furries. I hope they're in the bathrooms. The source I consider to be reliable. And so we're not immune here in Newton County uh, from things that are going on in this confused world. I think in order for us in 2023 to have godly families in the crooked and perverse generation in which we live, we have to first of all do two things. We are going to have to make a decision as to who we're going to serve. Are we going to be servants to the culture in which we live or are we going to be servants to God and His timeless principles? I think we have to make a choice up front. Who's going to be ruling our house? Joshua told the Israelites in Joshua 24, 15 that they had to make a choice. You need to decide who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the God of your fathers beyond the river? Are you going to serve the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? Or are you going to be with me? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And he encouraged them to be with him. Secondly, I think we're going to have to make a decision if we want to pay the price. Do we want to pay the price to live godly in this kind of world in which we live? In, in 2021, there was a, a father in Canada who refused to cower to his daughter who wanted to be referred to as a he or a him. And he refused to call his daughter that. And in Canada, they arrested him and put him in jail. In 2011, a 14-year-old boy in Texas received school suspensions because in a class where homosexuality was being discussed, he mentioned to the boy sitting next to him, I don't believe homosexuality is right. If you're standing up for God today in our culture, you might have to pay a pretty hard price. Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to serve God or culture? And so tonight I want to share with you, if we're going to be a godly family, I think we have to begin at square one. You must choose your spouse wisely. Now, for some of us, that's water under the bridge. But for some of you, it's not. Choose your spouse wisely. And, and I'm talking to both genders here, males and females. The Proverbs has a lot to say about what kind of spouse uh, you should be looking at. First of all, he says, an excellent wife who can find her worth is far above rubies or far above jewels. To find a good spouse or a good wife is a beautiful thing. 
It's invaluable. You can't put a price on a godly wife. But the Proverbs writer also offers some warnings. He said, it is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. It's better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. And he's, there are some other verses that he shares concerning that subject. But for you ladies, I want you to consider some of these things. He says, do not associate with a man given to anger. He who loves pleasure will become a poor man. The desire of the sluggard puts him to death, for his hands refuse to work. Don't marry a sluggard. Don't marry a man given to anger. And don't marry a man that, that pleasure is his first priority. There has to be more in choosing a mate that will help you get to heaven than physical attraction. That's a bonus. But the Proverbs writer also says, As a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. I think one of the most dangerous creatures on planet earth is a beautiful woman with an evil heart. But what should you be looking for in a spouse? Well, the Proverbs writer says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. You may not realize it when you're dating or when you're younger or you're you're less than 40, but faces wrinkle, bodies sag, and bones start to do funny things. But inside, inside there should be a soul that is growing more and more like Christ every day. And while the body and age goes like this, the soul should be going like this. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to observe a spouse who is growing more like Christ each passing year. And it's a true blessing to have that in your home. If we're going to have a godly home, we must not only start at square one with the right kind of spouse, but we must allow the Bible to determine the respective roles in the home. If we've made the decision that we're going to serve God instead of culture, then God's going to get to choose what the husband does, what the wife does, what the mom and what the dad does, and, and what the children do. And we won't spend a lot of time on this, but for children, it's, it's pretty simple. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right honor your father and mother it only makes sense that God should decide the roles that are within the home because who created the home in Genesis chapter 2 it was God so he gets to decide what makes a happy home a culture doesn't get to make that decision for husbands we're not going to give a lot of scriptural references for these duties, but they are from scripture. We covered those, these in a Wednesday night class not long ago in 1 Peter. Husbands and fathers are to provide for their family. They're to lead their family. They're to love their bride as Christ loved his, loved his bride and gave his life for her. The husband is to love his wife as his own body, nourishing and cherishing it. The husband is to love his wife as himself. If you're going to make a household, men, you need to leave and cleave. Go somewhere else besides mom and dad's house to make your house. For the wives, from Titus chapter 2, they are to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled. They're supposed to be good managers of household affairs, not just 
cleaners or housekeepers, but they're to manage the household affairs. And husbands, if, if they're doing a good job of that, they don't need your advice on how to load the dishwasher or arrange the refrigerator. Let them be the managers. Ladies are to be kind, subject to their husbands. And if we go to 1 Peter chapter 3, the lady's emphasis in her appearance is not to be external, but internal. She is to show chaste and respectful behavior, and she is to have a gentle and quiet spirit, being submissive to her husband. Oh, wait a sec. That's not what culture says, does it? But that's what God says. And if we're following God, we're following God. And God considers the gentle and quiet spirit to be precious in His sight. So if we're going to have a godly home, we have to follow God's instructions who design the home and so he has roles for children and wives and husbands if you're going to have a godly home in the third place as parents you have to be the leaders the leaders of the home this may seem not worth mentioning it mentioning but I think I don't have a good word for it without being very offensive. But the silliness we see on in society today is because parents, school administrators, government leaders are not being leaders. The wrong people are driving the bus. Parents, your children don't need you to be their best friends. They need you to give them guidance and instruction. I remember when David Shannon <clears throat> held a parenting seminar here a few years ago. He told the story about, I think it was a grandmother and her grandchild in the parking lot of a shopping center. They had got done, finished with their shopping and the, grands, the grandchild expressed an interest in getting behind the wheel of the vehicle, driving around in the parking lot just a little bit. Well, they ended up in the street. They ended up in an accident. Why did they end up in an accident? Because the wrong person was driving the car. And that's what's wrong in so many families today. The children telling the parents how it's going to be. You can witness it at Walmart or at the mall or at the city park. What the kid wants is what happens. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. In too many homes today, the wrong people are driving the bus. The fathers are to be the... Uh, ones who see that the children are raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's not the children's responsibility to raise themselves. It's the parents' responsibility to raise the children. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. And so, in raising the children, nurture and admonition or discipline and instruction involves discipline and it involves teaching. Many frown on the idea, and I think it's actually now against the law in California or so I've heard that corporal punishment is the kind of discipline that the Bible endorses. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and the rod of dis discipline will remove it far from him. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings his mother to shame. And that's how we came to have litter boxes in the high school. The wrong people are making the decisions. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you would look over there, and you'll notice starting in verse 4, 
Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. In my opinion, what is being taught here is that there are many opportunities to teach your children, not just in a daily devotional, but when you rise up, uh, when you walk in the way, when you lie down, there are opportunities at all times to teach our children and our grandchildren the, the truths that we find in the Bible. I remember <clears throat> driving through the pasture among the cows and uh, Jason asked me an embarrassing question. That was an opportunity I won't forget, but it was an opportunity I took to teach him how we uh, procreate as people. I didn't want to talk about it, but apparently he did. I have a daughter-in-law, my favorite daughter-in-law actually, Ashley's my favorite daughter-in-law, and she has in her dining room and in her kitchen, they have a, a, a little bit of chalkboard, a message board, and she, she puts scriptures or sayings on there, and she can change them all the time. Her kids see that when they come in in the morning to get ready for school. There might be scriptures on the refrigerator, uh, other places, but she has scripture in, in front of them all the time. She's taking advantage of opportunities. You might have an opportunity to teach your children or grandchildren when you're at the shopping center and you see a lady that needs help getting across the parking lot. You might have an opportunity to, to teach your children at a Little League ball game when the parents are cussing out the umpires or the coaches because they're dissatisfied. There are all kinds of opportunities that come up unexpectedly and for parents and grandparents, we need to be prepared to teach our children the truths of God's Word and make application <clears throat> because it is our job to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I don't know how often... Uh, you come to church. You're here on Sunday night, so you're probably here pretty regularly. So if you are here on Sunday morning, now you help me with my math, because my mom had to help me a long time ago. And I think we both cried trying to get that stuff done. So if you, if you come to church twice Sunday morning, I'm counting Bible class, <clears throat> you come Sunday night, I'm one behind, that's three hours. You come Wednesday night, that's four hours. That's four hours of Bible instruction that, that your child is receiving a week. Perhaps you are a family that is ahead of the curve and you have a 20-minute devotional every night, six nights a week. That gives you two more hours. That gives you six hours a week that you're giving instruction to your child or the Bible class teachers or the preacher is giving instruction to your child. If they go to school, in the public school, they have 30 to 35 hours a week that they are under the influence of the teachers you add, and other kids. There's 30 hours. You add TV that they watch. You add the Internet and social media, and your children are being indoctrinated by the world for probably over 50 hours a week. And how much instruction has God given them? Maybe six. Who's going to win that battle? Satan wants your children. And he has people, and he has devices, and he has the means to get your children. We have to be diligent and work to influence our children for good. They're the most precious 
thing we are stewards of, the souls of our children. Parents, to be the right kind of parents, you need to spend not only quality time, but quantity time with, with your children. I'm 65, and my, parent, my parents, my parent is here. What I was going to say is my children have been gone for 20 years from the home. And I'm like Job. I recall with fondness the days when my, my children were around me. If your children are still home, take advantage of the opportunity you have to influence them for good. And spend time with them. There's a little poem that I've, I've shared before. It's called No Time to Play. My precious boy with the golden hair came up one day beside my chair and fell upon his bended knee and said, Oh, Mommy, please play with me. I said, No, not now. Go on and play. I've got so much to do today. He smiled through tears in eyes so blue when I said, we'll play when I get through. But the chores lasted all through the day, and I never did find time to play. When supper was over and dishes were done, I was so tired, too tired for my little son. I tucked him in and kissed his cheek and watched my angel fall asleep. As I tossed and turned upon my bed, those words kept ringing in my head. Not now, son, go and play. I've got so much to do today. I fell asleep, and in a minute span, my little boy is a full-grown man. No toys are there to clutter the floor, no dirty fingerprints on the door, no snacks to fix, no tears to dry. The rooms just echo my lonely sigh. And now I've only and now I've got the time to play, but my precious boy has gone away. I awoke myself with a pitiful scream and realized it was just a dream. For across the room in his little bed lay my curly-haired boy, the sleepyhead. My work will wait till another day, for now I must find some time to play. Time is fleeting. Take advantage of the time you have with the children you have in your home now. Parents must also, if they're going to have a godly home in this perverse world, they must set the right kind of example for their children. Did you know that children can spot a hypocrite, a hypocrite faster than anybody else? They can see him for a mile away. And the loudest sermon or teaching that you will ever give to your children is not what you say as you point your finger at them, but what they see and how you live. The example that you set before them, that's the loudest teaching that you can ever do. You can put on a show in public, you can have the best profile picture that social media has ever, ever seen, you can be here on Sunday morning with all smiles and your family portrait may look perfect. But when you go home and the door shut outside, your children see the real you. They see how you treat your wife or your husband. They hear what you say and how you speak. They see where your priorities are. We have to live Christ before our family not just before our children, but before our spouses. Actions speak much louder than words. When we demonstrate good sportsmanship, they will be good sports. When we meet life with laughter and a twinkle in our eye, they will develop a sense of humor. When we are thankful for life's blessings, they will be thankful. When we express friendliness, they will be friendly. When we confront failure and defeat and misfortune with a gallant spirit, they will live bravely. But by the same token, when we use foul language, 
our children will use foul language. When we speak hateful of other people, our children will learn to speak hateful to other people. When we decide to drink in our home, it's likely our children will also decide that drinking is a good thing. And when we decide that church isn't important today, I think I'll just stay home. It's likely that your children will grow up not attending church. We must live godly lives before our family. And I want to say this. I've had to apologize to my children, and I think once I apologized to Christy. Maybe twice. But none of us are perfect, right? Jesus was perfect. This book is perfect. But we make mistakes because we're people. We need to learn as parents to say the words, I'm sorry, I was wrong, or I made a mistake. I've had to do that. I've whipped the wrong child, or I wasn't in control when I did spank them. Perhaps we ignore a, an, an important day. Perhaps we say something heatedly that we shouldn't have said. We need to learn to own our mistakes and live before our children honestly and openly and lovingly, setting the right example. In one of his gospel meetings uh, from this pulpit, Phil, and Phil Sanders indicated that the worst thing we could ever experience as a parent is to find ourselves in the fires of hell and hear these words. Dad, is that you? Mom, is that you? If we don't live right before our children, it's not just going to damn our souls but we'll take them with us. And we don't want to hear those words. We must live godly lives and set good examples for our children. If we're going to have godly lives in an LGBTQ plus world, we must put the Lord's church first. Now, I grew up in a home, believe it or not, where when there was church doors open, we were at church. And you might say, well, duh, your dad was a preacher. He had, to, he had to go to church. He got paid to do that. But he didn't get paid. And Mom didn't get paid to go to Green Valley Bible Camp. They didn't get paid to put the four-state news out every month for 35 or 40 years. There were gospel meetings a long distance away where mom was left at home. There were visits to be made. There were meetings to attend. And every time there was an activity, we were present. We, we didn't have a question as to where we would be on Sunday or Wednesday. Now, why would... Why would two people raise a family like that? Why would they not only be at church every time the doors are open, but do all these other extracurricular activities that involve the whole family and the church? I would suggest to you it's because Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. These things, the things we need. We put God first. We put the church first. We'll have everything we actually need to serve Him. Peter said everything pertaining to life and godliness is provided. And so we must put the church first. And when the doors are open, we need to be there with our families because we have children who are watching. When children see that church attendance, church activities are not important to mom and dad, that it's optional, 
they likely won't be involved in them as, as adults. Perhaps you don't see the importance of the church. Perhaps you don't see the, the value of it. But let's not forget that God thought the church was really important. God thought the church was valuable. And he gave his only son to buy it. Let's make it important in our lives as well. I don't know when I started, but it's probably time to wind down, so I'll leave point umpteen to, to you. I want to ask you a question here at the end. A godly home in a crooked and perverse generation should be a place, a place where God is in charge, a place where there is refuge and peace from the turmoil of all the world. A godly home should be a place where love and honesty are lived, where questions can be asked without intrepidation or fear, where you can confess wrongdoing with a penitent heart and expect encouragement. A godly home is a place where loving instruction is available, and a godly home is a place where a wayward sinner can come back to with a penitent heart and expect to be welcomed as the prodigal son was in his daddy's house. Does this describe your home? I hope it does. Our homes are the the fabric that make up our society, and the culture is trying to destroy them. Let's do our best to make our homes godly homes, according to the pattern that we find in Scripture. Perhaps you're here tonight and you need to become a Christian. You can do so through believing in Christ and His claims to be the Son of God, dying on the cross to save us. Confessing that belief and repenting of your sins, you can be baptized into Christ and become a part of His church. If you're a wayward Christian, if you need to come back to God, you can do so through repentance and prayer and confession of wrongdoing. And If you have another need that we can help you with or pray with you about, please come as we stand and sing.